Okay. I, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome, uh, everyone, to the CFI International Symposium. This event is organized as part of the World Bank Center of Excellence on Cooperative uh, Financial Institutions. The Center of Excellence is one of the core activities of a joint project we have with Rabo Foundation and Partnerships for the development of cooperative financial institutions. I'm Anderson Silva, the practice manager of long-term finance team at the Finance Competitive and Innovation Global Practice of the World Bank. One of the main focus areas of the World Bank's financial sector work is financing of the real sector. Financial services of CFIs for rural businesses, especially agriculture, is a lifeline of tens of millions of rural households. They are evidently one of the most important financial institutions in the rural setting. We would like to discuss throughout this symposium CFI's promises and challenges in rural development. Indeed, this opening session will be followed by five technical sessions from tomorrow until November 10th and the closing session on November 11th. We are very excited to have excellent speakers covering various themes such as rural financial inclusion and agriculture finance, rural outreach, women and wolf, and regulatory and policy issues. Uh, we organized a similar international conference on CFIs in 2018 in a very different setting. We are very happy to see many of you again and a very warm welcome to those who attend a, a Center of Excellence ev event for the first time. We greatly appreciate the general support by the government of the Netherlands and the Rabo Foundation, which made the launch of the World Bank Center of Excellence for CFIs and the symposium possible. We also would like to thank our partners for this symposium, Rabo, uh, WACU, ICERN, DGRV, and DID. They are the co-organizers of the technical sessions. Please visit uh, uh, the symposium web for details if you have not signed up yet. I'm pleased now to introduce the moderator of the panel, Marianne Shoemaker, Managing Director of Rabo Partnerships, a Rabo Bank Group company focused on rural financial inclusion in emerging countries, and our key partner for the CFI development project. Marianne, over to you and, and big success uh, in, in this launching uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anderson. And welcome to the audience. Welcome to the speakers, the panelists, and all other uh, interested parties that are watching this uh, webinar. I'm very pleased to be able to open the International uh, Symposium with the highly interesting and intriguing topic, CFIs in Rural Development, Promise and Challenges. Uh, my name is Marianne Schoemaker. I'm the Managing Director of Rabo Partnerships. This, in this session of almost one hour, we will be setting the stage for, a, for this highly interesting uh, symposium week, full with dedicated speakers from the field, from the representatives, regulators, sharing their knowledge and expertise with you as an audience, discussing CFIs, their promises and their challenges. Cooperative financing has historically been at the core of agricultural and rural development, not only in Europe, North America, but globally. And working for an institution as Rabobank with a history of 120 years provides us with ample experience to share with others. And leading up to this symposium, five podcasts were recorded. And I highly recommend listening to these podcasts. And one of these, it's done with Barry Martin, man board member of Rabobank and president of the European Association of Cooperative Banking. He talks about cooperative banking and Rabobank's involvement in banking in Tanzania, Brazil, Australia and other places. And to him, key values are the close community base of financial cooperatives. The fact that financial cooperative success means members' success, and that the clients of the cooperatives are also influencing the strategy and the direction of the cooperative, which influences, gives direct influence from the members to the direction 
of these cooperatives. And today, CFIs are active in over 120 countries, comprising 375 million uh, members, and that is even that is not even including the European uh, the European population of members. The membership has grown to seven percent over the last decade, and with a penetration rate of varying eight to twelve percent of the economically active population. At Rumble Partnerships, we strongly, strongly believe that financial inclusion is catalyst for rural development and food security. And we also believe that driving financial inclusion and food security requires joining forces, partnerships across diverse stakeholders and partners, including multilaterals, development banks, governments, NGOs and fintech. The symposium aims precisely bringing together all these parties uh, of the community of CFI stakeholders to share what we know, what we've experienced and what we have yet to discuss in view of the future and future developments and to enhance the impact of CFIs. And we want to share this knowledge with a broader audience, with practice, practitioners, policy makers, to further mainstream CFI deport, support in development uh, organizations and government policy makers. And to carry out this event, the Center of Excellence for CFIs, as referred to by Anderson already, is part of a joint program between World Bank and Rabobank. And it is greatly benefited from contributions of and leadership of the major global CFI institutions and practitioners. And the agenda for the upcoming days is rich with their experiences and insights. And I highly recommend subscribing for next uh, uh, sessions uh, as you can do via the link, which will definitely be shared in the chat. In this opening panel, we are fortunate to have a high level representatives of three of the main stakeholders of the categories. Peter Nyuguna, CEO of the regulatory agency for CFIs in Kenya named Sasra. Welcome, Peter. He brings in a lot of experience both in developing CFIs capacity and strengthening the regulation and supervisory system. Jean Pemi. Global Director for Finance at the World Bank, where the Center of Excellence for CFIs is housed. Welcome, Jean. He leads the World Bank's work to promote the development of sound, stable, sustainable and inclusive financial systems. And Mathieu Soglounou, CEO of CIF, Confédération des Institutions Financières CIF in Western Africa that is making substantial progress, strengthening six large networks in five countries in an, ambition, in an ambitious effort to expand financial inclusion in the region. Welcome to all of you. And we could have, well, let's say we could have a talk and a decision a discussion for two days, I think, but we only have 40, 45 minutes left. So maybe I can start with you, Peter. Could you give us a quick overview of how the sector looks like in Kenya and how it has uh, evolved, especially during COVID? Uh, thank you very much, Marianne, for the uh, introduction. Uh, the Kenya circle industry is uh, comprises of two tiers. We have um, CFIs that are under prudential regulation, that is under SASRA, and the small ones under $1 million are still under the registrar or commissioner for cooperatives. Now, SACOs in Kenya have um, account for about 12% of the you know, banking assets, that's about um, 6.5 billion, that is about $65 billion of assets. They account for 12% uh, serving uh, an estimated 6 million uh, Kenyans, and which is about, uh, again, 12% of the total population is about 51%. And uh, again, of the adult population, they account for about 20%. Uh, and therefore, looking at 
how they have evolved. Uh, we have seen tremendous growth and development in circles from small institutions offering basically savings and credit products to gradual development to full service institutions offering payment solutions. Now we are going to what they call circle assurance, including now going beyond household needs to business agricultural loans. That's a journey we have worked and we have seen that from the data we, we collect. Now, uh, the circle regulatory agency in Kenya regulates uh, tier one circles which are offer banking services. We have 177 of them spread across the country. We also have tier two, which uh, that is uh, the ones that offer plain savings and credit products, no payment solutions and the like, another 180. I have to underscore that we just onboarded this new tier two institution this year. And that has pushed the total assets of circles under SASRA to about eight billion in dollars, and those are the assets they co they, they command. Uh, through the throughout the pandemic, it was very interesting for us that when you look at data for 2020 comparing to 2021 and 2019, we have seen tremendous improvement in the sense that these circles retained, sustained the growth, double digit, an average of 12% in deposit, uh, in assets funded mainly by a deposit, showing the resilience of CFIs even in the face of pandemic. Why is this critical? Remember, CFIs are, are member-based financial institutions, and therefore, whether there is a crisis or pandemic, they have to stand with their members. And I think for Kenya, I must, um, share that we were very, very, uh, you know, uh, surprised because in the March to June, there was slowdown in lending. Some institutions, CFIs below 50%, others to at start still, but overall, after July, then they started lending. And we saw a lot of resilience because closing the year, the comparison in growth was the same for, last, uh, for the previous year, 2019, 2018. So that demonstrates the promise that these institutions hold for their members and the citizens in general, especially in developing countries like ourselves. So we are, I'm talking of $8, million, uh, $8 billion in assets, and we are expecting that in this year to grow, perhaps to grow uh, to the regions of $8.5 to $9 billion. That underscores. Now, moving on to the question of integration, I, I think integration, I, I interpret it to mean how one, the institutions are integrating the financial needs of their members from basic financial institutions to offer financial services offered their members. And I have, so we, we must say that we have seen a lot of progress. The tier one, tier two circles we talk uh, about in Kenya, CFIs, are such that the tier one are bank-like institutions. They have demand accounts, they can offer debit cards, they can offer payment solutions, and they can even offer other solutions like uh, insurance by partnering with uh, underwriters. And therefore, what you have seen that in, as institutions, they have evolved gradually to respond to the members' needs. As a member, you have your house, you need business loans, these circles will be able to package business loans for you. If you have, you know, in trade finance, they'll be able to do that. Agriculture, they'll be able to do that. But more important, what we have seen is the last 10 years, them integrating to the payment system to offer payment solutions. Partner with the banks to offer checks, a checking account, partner with banks to offer uh, eight debit cards, and even partner with the fintechs to offer digital finance channels or mobile finance solutions. This is the kind of integration at institutional level. Now, uh, now at the industry level, are we seeing integration of the SACO as a system to the national payment system, to the national financial system? Now, that is, again, where we still have a lot of work to do, because that, as I've said, is that institutions are partnering with banks, which in Kenya are regulated by the central banks, to offer those solutions. Of course, and even fintechs, because of the capacity they have to partner. What does that do? It brings, of course, is, is inefficient, uh, in the sense that it's costly. There are a lot of fees have to be loaded before the client gets the value. But we'd say, and this is where the conversation is now, uh, we allow circles to offer demand deposits, payment solutions. If they have to play their role in financial inclusion, then what 
next must we do? Those are questions that at policy level, structural level that we are facing today to ask ourselves, how do we get uh, to deliver the promise that TFIs hold for their members because we believe they are at half their capacity. I'll stop there, Marianne. Okay, maybe maybe one additional question to you, Peter. So, so thank you very much for your first setting the scene on, on Kenya. Uh, can you share with us as an audience what your main learnings are as a regulator working with SECOs? Uh, thank you very much. You are right. I think uh, prior to coming to being a regulator, I worked in development agency, uh, WOKU, and therefore that, and I think um, uh, at SASRA, we're also lucky. As we started at the first uh, cohort, we had a number of us who came from the industry, either from the state department or from the industry as practitioner. And that was very critical because CFIs are unique institutions. You have to understand them with their smallness and that they are community-based. And that becomes important that as you bring the regulations, which largely is designed on the principles of stability, then you have to domesticate those principles in application by bringing the understanding of the model, because the SACO model in Kenya, SACO business model in Kenya could differ from that in Brazil. And that becomes very important. You contextualize and you develop uh, tools and uh, you know guidelines that actually talk to the business reality. Because what we had to do, the experience is that we had to implement prudential regulatory framework that is 10 years back in 2010 in a manner that it does not disrupt or destabilize the offering of financial services to the members. Because remember, the farmer in the rural, rural setting does not understand stability. All they want is, can I get my savings? Can I get my credit? And therefore, as a regulator of a CFI, you have to balance, okay? Use your experience. And this was very critical for us who came from the field to know the member who is the owner, who is a depositor, who is a borrower, and therefore highly conflicted, you have to show him the importance of preserving his institution for posterity so that he understand, he is able to connect. And that is very critical for Kenya, where large circles are, you know, you have teachers, farmers, and all that. And therefore the tools we develop, partnering with the industry, we develop guidelines, we develop templates to assist them. What is capital adequacy? What is liquidity? You develop simple tools that you're able to work with these people, the directors, then you go to the technical staff to make sure that they work with you. And we also work with the trade associations to develop tools that are simple to make sure you preserve the very purpose of the CFI, but you are, on the long term, you attain the stability that is so critical for them to deliver the promise that they actually hold for their members. That was very critical, able to blend the reality, practical, the business model, and I can say that where we are today, the industry is uh, stable and we have capitalization. Some institutions, we have minimum of 10%. We had some of the institutions are doing uh, above 15%, some above 20%. Why? Because they are able to balance member needs in terms of returns of liquidity and then building capital, building uh, institutional infrastructure, the technology, branching out, and we have seen, even investment technology, we have seen the industry grow to a very resilient industry that was able to wade through COVID. And we believe this has only prepared, prepared CFIs in Kenya for greater things to come. And I'm sure we'll have that conversation as we continue. Thank you very much, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And this is a clear and very nice example, I think, from a partnership of a regulator with the business itself. And I think that it could serve as a great example. And I'm I'm pretty sure that there's lots of learnings for others in different markets, in different contexts, um, to learn from the successful example of, of Kenya and the uh, involvement of the regulator SASRA in uh, furthering and enhancing uh, CFIs in, in, in Kenya. Um, Maybe a next question to you, Jean. Uh, the World Bank Group wrapped up its annual meetings a couple of weeks ago only with concerns about reversal in development due to pandemic, increasing poverty levels and persistent inequality. How can community-based institutions such as CFIs, in your view, make a difference in this environment? 
Thank you very much, Marianne, and thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. It's really a great opportunity, and, and I'm sure that um, the whole week and the symposium will be of interest to everybody. So maybe to, to go directly to your question. Yes, we, there are concerns on, on the impact of the crisis on people's lives, jobs, livelihood, sustenance, and really seeing increasing in poverty. So that's uh, that actually the bank is responding with an agenda around what is called green, green resilience, inclusion, uh, so the inclusion angle and making sure that we can reach out to everybody and leverage all the instruments that we have is an important element. So if you look, if I look at it more from the financial sector perspective, even though the financial sector has actually been extremely useful in the crisis, including to deliver basic services, they are still concerned around our indebtedness, uh, potential exposure of financial institutions to companies and households that are in a worse situation than they were before. And so I was hearing with a lot of interest what Peter was saying, uh, which is reassuring. But at the same time, we know that in some country, uh, due to regulatory forbearance, we don't know exactly what's the situation in terms of, uh, of viability of companies and the uh, potential of indebtedness of households, and therefore where we stand in terms of uh, the financial sector, including CFI. Now, on the other hand, what we've seen is that the crisis has brought opportunity, in particular around uh, digital. I mean. This is something that was already in process before, but there is a kind of acceleration of time uh, in the use of digital financial services, in particular in terms of digital payments and mobile money transactions. The volume has increased 15% in volume, 22% in value in 2020. So that's huge and that's actually very good. And we need to capitalize on that. Now, CFIs have played and must continue to play a very significant role in terms of financial inclusion and access to financial services for part of the population, which otherwise would be unbanked, in particular in rural areas. So there is no doubt in our mind that CFIs have a very strong uh, role to play. And at the same time, in some countries, so maybe not in Kenya, which is very good news, they may be challenged because of the transformation of the financial system uh, and the coming to digital and the challenges it may create. And at the same time, also for more classical stability issues. So we need to watch that carefully and make sure that we support the evolution of the sector in this new environment with more competition, more opportunities, and potentially also um, credit risks that have changed compared to where we were before. So our, our job in that respect in countries where that's relevant, and, and that's why we very much welcome the partnership with Rabo and everybody around the table is really how to position CFI, how to strengthen them, how to improve the regulatory framework so that we can prepare them for the future and make sure that the inclusion angle of our agenda really uh, leverages their capabilities. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean, on this uh, clear, uh, clear elaboration on the on the topic and the question. And maybe then it's now time to uh, ask a question to Mathieu uh, from the field as a practitioner in West Africa. Um, uh, Mathieu, uh, very pleased as World Bank and Rabobank to collaborate with SIF in this joint program. So could you please explain a bit about SIF, uh, the different components of your strategy and how they substantially expand financial inclusion in your, in your member countries? Merci beaucoup, Marianne. Thank you so much, Marianne, for giving me the floor. First, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference, especially Rabo Foundation, the World Bank, uh, the DID, and others who invited SIF to this conference, this very high level conference. So, you would like to know more about SIF. SIF, I would like to specify that it is a confederation of six CFIs in five countries in West Africa, Benin, Burkina. Mali, Senegal, and Togo, which today have impacted 4,600,000 clients. 45% are women, 30% are small producers, 25% are youth. In the uh, West African space, the UMOA space, there have been uh, partnerships with the private sector, insurance companies created 
so as to offer offer complementary services to their members and also a bank with a digital platform to increase access to digital services today sif and its members uh, have 800 million dollars 7 million in credit 1.5 billion in assets i agree with peter that this is not at the same level as kenya but we are on the right path we have a capitalization that is estimated at four billion dollars and we work with 5,000 employees, 48% are women. In West Africa, I would say that we work in several countries at the same time, and we are focused on rural financing. To arrive at these results, we count on the resilience of our institutions, especially during COVID. During COVID, the institutions did remain resilient. SIF and its members specialized in community financial services for small producers, uh, PME, uh, P, to put it to put in place agricultural loans, specific loans for women and young people, insurance and payments. But the health and security crisis in the Sahel really put the our clients' resilience to the test. So we had to develop strategies to continue to work with our clientele and widen it. So in October 2020, we adopted a strategy based on two pillars. The first for us is an approach based on the client, centered on the client in our services. We began int by introducing new products such as a rural tool and, and rural lodging. So in many countries, there are uh, housing products offered to more affluent residents, but now we are focusing on the more modest uh, housing. We see that in the rural environment, there's been cotton production, but there's been also a lot of flooding, a lot of rain, and half of the village was affected. And so we began to look at what are we doing for our clients? So now we're focusing on rural housing with, an, uh, with a focus on energy and ecological transition and financing agricultural investments, financing the areas in which women work, such as forest production, so that women can have access to the resources needed to for their empowerment. The second pillar of our strategy has to do with digital transformation and information systems. Today, technology requires of us that we increase our capacity in this regard. So we are joining this transform this digital transformation with new distribution channels such as access to ATMs through a card connected to our clients' accounts. There's an electronic wallet, and there are also networks in place to expand digital financial services payments so that our clients' resources are more accessible. In the past, they didn't have access to their funds except for a few hours a day. Now we're allowing them to have 24 hours, uh, 24 hours of access to their funds with deposits and withdrawals. And they've been able to, able to, to consult their balances. We are working to optimize decision making by putting in place credit scoring and credit analysis by the credit committees. We are uh, keeping track of the risks, especially the security situation. And we are focusing on fighting financial crimes. And there's also the financial environment with uh, involvement with money laundering for financing terrorism. And these, there are partnerships that we have initiated we're working with the with the World Bank 
and others to really support these two fundamental pillars. So Marianne, this is what I can share with you on these two pillars that we put in place so that we can expand financial services in West Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mathieu, for this insight from the ground and all the challenges you're facing and well, the adaptation to the new realities which come up. And in, in previous interactions, you have also spent quite a bit of time on business viability and uh, stressing business viability for uh, CFIs. And so maybe if we look at the future of CFIs and you look at, let's say, the theme around business viability as a key challenge for CIF in, in, in West Africa, can you elaborate a bit on the future and your ideas about business uh, viability when it comes to CIF and is, uh, its activities in, in Western Africa? Merci beaucoup, Marianne, for cette occasion. Thank you very much, Marianne, for this opportunity to talk about the viability of our institutions. To, before we go to the strategy, I'd like to go back to the role played by the governments in terms of financial resilience of our institutions. It is important to strengthen uh, monitoring of the activities and also adopt minimum protection measures for small producers and SMEs. I think this is the important, this is the, the most, the core of our economies so that they must have access to markets, those small producers and SMEs because they are main resources. As you know, climate change, new technologies have transform agribusiness as a global challenge. And so we must go to innovation. Furthermore, we must work with fintech, agri-tech sectors, also small producers. Today have a completely transformed profile. Now they have a high-tech component and they can be high tech from their beds. They can sell their products. And today, thanks to technology, there is a world that is more and more isolated sometimes and cooperatives must strengthen the solidarity aspect. So small producers must be protected. The interpreter apologizes, but Matthew is breaking up with implemented a strategy to strengthen the operational aspects, everything related to portfolio, the credit facilities that are combined with insurance policies, and also the capitalization so that the COVID-19 shocks can be better absorbed. We're working to improve the governance of our institutions so that they can be more agile, if you will. Uh, we have digitalized those at uh, 50%. And finally, we've also worked on social responsibility for both employees and employers to actually look for the social impact of our actions and also protect employees so that they can become shareholders. For example, for the insurance policies, we've created an institution for that. And so the employees of such entities can become shareholders and actually have a sense of belonging that way and be more productive. So the profile of the cooperation, the cooperative producer, if you would, has changed today. And we are working very heavily on that to pursue on that trend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mathieu, for uh, 
uh, the, for sharing the experiences and sharing uh, a lot of examples with you for, uh, with the audience. And I see that you're keeping up with the changes occurring in the market to also reach youth as well as rejuvenate the membership base or at least make it um, uh, attractive for future organ uh, for future uh, generations to become members and to stay a member of the of the cooperatives so thank you very much for uh, giving your insights of western africa and there seems to be a lot on your plate where you are working on and uh, wishing you all success with uh, all this this with filling your strategy in these in these various markets under the current circumstances um, maybe going back to Jean for a moment. Um, rural women and rural youth, uh, Jean, are arguably most excluded from formal finance. And related to this, you co-authored a recent blog about empowering women, and also mentioned by Mathieu and, and Peter, women in, in, uh, by making transfer payments directly to them. And the blog concludes with a statement that directing digital payments to women is critical, is a critical aspect in this journey. Uh, given CVI's pervasive presence in rural areas, is there a case to emphasize reaching rural women and youth with digital transfer payments through CVI's? And what in your view would take it to support such an approach? Ciao. Thank you very much, uh, Maya. Inclusion, 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 and particularly inclusion of women. That's really a top priority for us. So that was before COVID, but I think there is really clear evidence that the COVID crisis has affected women disproportionately in terms of household, in terms of women-led SMEs, women-led companies. So it's really, really important that we made a conscious, deliberate effort towards inclusion of women. Uh, measure the progress that we are doing, but also make sure that in terms of instrument, in terms of outreach, women are really a top priority and that they also become part of the decision making. Uh, so uh, we have a couple with our colleagues from IFC, a couple of initiatives in other in some region uh, where there's actually a training being provided to financial institution and bring women in the decision making process. And one of the outcomes that you see is that it facilitates the customer relationship onboarding, but also the, de the design of the product and instrument so that they uh, are easier to use and more likely to be picked up uh, by women. So uh, really important, and I, I will not emphasize that, that enough. Uh, so um, youth, of course, uh, but let me make a, a special pitch uh, for women, uh, in particular in rural areas, where sometimes uh, SIFs are actually the only game in town. So it's really important that uh, there is a, a conscious effort uh, for this outreach. Uh, so I think some of it is making sure that women are more part of, uh, women and youth are more part of SIF. So there is an outreach element. There is an element of uh, being represented as members, as managers. So I understand that there is quite a bit of initiative in that respect. So it's an issue of scaling up and making sure that this happens more to have increased uh, women representation. Uh, and and um, bodies like the World Council of Credit Union are actively promoting women leadership. So I think we need also to showcase and make sure that there is um, leading by example and that there is dissemination of these very good examples. So that's one angle. Now, the other angle to your question is around digital. Um, and so I mentioned that in terms of transformation of the financial sector that pre, pre, uh, predated COVID, but as a, somehow accelerated, I think both Mathieu and Peter have really highlighted the importance and the challenge of digitalizing CFIs in terms of their own functioning, but also in terms of their own uh, products. And that's one of the elements where having proper proportionate as needed tiered regulation will become very important. In some cases, just so that they have access to the national payment system or that when the services are provided by a more classical bank, it's easier to do. Some of it, as Mathieu mentioned, may be related to concern around integrity. So if the CFI cannot convince their service provider that they have the appropriate element, it will not work. So it's two elements. One, their own digitalization. 
The second element is building the capacity to do it. And the third element, and we, I come back to the theme at the start, of proper regulation, not coming with the same regulation as a big financial institution, but somehow level playing field and proportionate regulation and supervision so that there is trust and so that they have also access to tools which otherwise wouldn't be available. And digital is really an opportunity, not in terms of access only, but also uh, more use of digital and digital financial services so that we can go to the next level and integrate and include in particular women. And I will finish on that. There is really evidence that digital is bringing women in the system and that when they receive directly the fund, they are more in control, the funds are well used and therefore they have more economic opportunity. Back to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Jean. And maybe it's nice to also have Peter's view, have from the regulator on this landscape of CFIs that is changing very rapidly. And so we've seen various trends of digitization, uh, needs for transparency, and environmental sustainability. And can you describe how this impacts CFI sector, but also link that to the regulatory pressure that is felt by the larger financial institutions, but also will have its impact on the very small ones and the SACOs. So how do you go about that? And how could regulators in general facilitate CFIs staying rele relevant in these evolving markets? Yeah, th th thank you. Thank you, Marianne, again, for the opportunity to share the insights from, from Kenya. <clears throat> I think Kenya, as um, uh, uh, you know, we all may observe, has been very much the laboratory where a lot of uh, digital mobile innovations are, are actually tested. And therefore, what you've seen is circles uh, with the digitization, what circles have done, CFIs, is actually to right to, they saw this as an opportunity by and large that they were able to move in, in their own ways to actually utilize these capabilities. Why did this happen? The fintechs around, small, big, especially the small ones, saw the opportunity to partner with the CFIs. And I think from back 2010, we saw in the coming of M-Pesa, CFIs in Kenya took the advantage to partner with the fintechs to actually offer solutions. And we have seen that gradual. So as the ec mobile ecosystem has expanded, circles have gone from simple pay payment solutions to actually you know, a whole mobile wallet. We are seeing now credit being offered. It's, that's where it's going today. But then that is the case for the larger, you know, larger CFIs. The smaller ones in this space, what we have seen is that they are being squeezed in the market. Today, we have a situation where we have about the 40 largest um, CFIs, that is about $50 million and above, are accounting for about 70% of the market. So increasing market concentration. What does this tell us? It is telling us the smaller institutions are struggling to keep up with digitization. And I think because of the cost, both in terms of capital outlay to acquire software and uh, the related infrastructure uh, that is secure to also hiring staff, and that, that is a real challenge that we have seen across the spectrum because also digitization also comes with the cyber threats and the associated risk, costly and all that. And the model we have seen in Kenya, you have seen it's costly. They are in attended risks by the vendors and the like. And as, as a regulator, that has been has seen as issue guidelines. But for the smaller uh, CFIs, what we began from uh, two years ago is to you know, engage the industry. We have drawn policies that we see will uh, bring the conversation about shared digital platforms to the center. I think right now we have had that conversation. There's conviction that cooperation among cooperatives like what Mathias has shared is the way to go. That is what will assure the viability because technology is rapidly changing, like you said. But we are, we are now pushing for you know, uh, cooperation among where we are able to set up, uh, you know, pushing for a case for technology platform. We are banking on the World Bank, a project in Kenya to support us in that. They have worked with us along the journey. And we see that being a huge opportunity that holds a lot of promise for the smaller circles who are not able, who do not have the financial muscle, neither do they have, have the, the capacity human-wise. 
and especially when they are in far from rural Kenya, when you have that kind of, um, you know, shared platform, because inter internet connectivity is reasonably good, then they can actually enjoy it. As a regulator, we, our job is, uh, you know, leading the conversation through policy, through guidelines that we are in guiding the market. And that is, but now this then uh, will also require a lot of support from development agencies because uh, these are the kind of solutions, especially in Kenya, where you will need a lot of, um, you know, alternative voice to bring CFIs in the core of discussion, especially when you think about rural of finance and youth and the agricultural finance. And we are seeing that conversation has attracted attention. There is a huge support. Now where we are going, the next phase is actually to invest, put the dollars where our mouth is, is by investing in a technological platform where CFIs can actually, you know, plug, uh, you know, and therefore uh, economies of scale, economies of scale, they can get more sophisticated system that are secure and more efficiently to actually serve their members. That, that's really where we are. From environmental sustainability, obviously we have seen that and blessing of this is also improving uh, because now the less of papers, we have seen some of the leading institutions saying no, now we no longer accept paperwork for loan application, even re re registration joining the, the institution. We want you to scan, scan to us and we are seeing now that conversation for the larger CFIs. Now the shared digital platform uh, you, under the principle of cooperation among cooperatives is a promise that I see or the hope that I will see for the smaller CFIs who are not only experiencing competition from their larger CFIs, banks, but more importantly, from the digital lenders, a space that in Kenya is not regulated. Uh, there is a conversation today to regulate them, but that has also brought a stiff competition through digital lenders because then they go direct to the customer, they have the digital analytics, they have the business analytic capabilities, and that has brought. But we believe by circles coming together, then they can actually uh, and uh, partner with fintechs to actually get that which their competitors are outdoing them by bringing to their customers. Thank you, Malian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And what I get from your contribution is that, well, although there is a huge distinction between the larger and the smaller CFIs, that it's not a definitely not a lost case for the smaller CFIs. No, uh, to the contrary, I would say, um, uh, with uh, the initiative to create shared digital platform to join forces to see how you can bring them uh, to par or even beyond uh, when it comes to embracing digitization in a very efficient in an efficient manner. Um, that also um, stresses the importance of collaboration and partnership, I would say, and joining forces. Um, and maybe, Jean, with uh, almost the last question of this uh, session uh, to you, um, uh, World Bank and Rabobank are working together in three countries to strengthen CFIs and their regulatory environment. Can you tell us what the World Bank wants to achieve and how it will contribute to rural development, but also with a view to the future, with a perspective on future development? Uh, Having listened to all the speakers, uh, Mathieu, Peter, and the developments taking place in the various parts of Africa, uh, or at least Kenya and Western Africa, and there's far more to say about, well, uh, globally, but maybe for you uh, from World Bank uh, and the Rabo collaboration to focus on what you as World Bank would like to achieve and where you would like to uh, put maybe a bit more emphasis, maybe uh, even going forward, uh, looking at the challenges that are currently, well, let's say, in, in scope of um, the, 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 the practitioners and, and people playing in the field. Jean, over to you. Thank you very much, Mayan. So I think the discussion has shown the importance to provide really enhanced support to the CFI. I mean, they, they play a very important role. There is already... Um, a transformation of the sector that is coming. And as Peter just mentioned, even if the sector is not starting on its own to transform, there will be competitive pressure, new players that would make it extremely important. And I think there is also very clear evidence that when this is well done, this is really a win-win. 
in particular, uh, in terms of inclusion, rural community, and 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 and, and agri finance. So I think the case is very much there and and uh, very important for us. And in the countries, I mean, part of as you know, the bank works on client demand. So in the countries where uh, the uh, the CFI um, sector is an important part of the financial sector, uh, we are very very keen to engage and to leverage somehow the platform that is provided by this initiative. So I think in terms of partnership between the bank and, and Rambo, on the one hand, what we are trying to bring is our knowledge on regulatory supervisory environment and customized to the specific of CFI. And you are bringing a lot of knowledge um, as, as a successful cooperative bank, lots of expertise. And at the same time, you are technical assistance provider to some of the institution. So for us, that's a really great partnership because it brings diff very complementary uh, lots of things brought together. So indeed, we cannot do that in every country in the world. So we have some priorities, but the objective is that building on the impact and results achieved in this three initiative, then we can disseminate. And that's the logic of the center of excellence, which is really knowledge generation and dissemination and be able to bring those very good examples elsewhere. So it, I mean, the team gave me the example of what has happened in Albania and the, the Fed Invest. I think it's a really good example of how much you can achieve by bringing those pieces together in terms of improving regulatory framework, helping with the consolidation of the industry, working with the regulators, that not losing uh, the foothold in terms of local presence and serving uh, communities which otherwise would be isolated and at the same time, making this new institution both a more sustainable one, where one where depositors are protected. So uh, that's where the benefit of the regulation and at the same time, consolidation of the industry and we're into digital. So we want more of these success stories and then together being able to leverage them for the future with the key objective of, of inclusion and be responsive to communities which otherwise uh, would be uh, left, left aside. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. And that almost brings us to the end of this opening session. And I do think that there, we have touched on various topics during this hour, uh, of which um, COVID is one and the uh, robustness of the financial institutions that we were discussing in COVID in, 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 during the pandemic, but also the challenges the, they face. Um, Next to that, I do think that it clearly stood out to me that the regulator and the regulatory uh, assistance from uh, SASRA, uh, as an example uh, for others, I think brings valuable insights in how it can work in collaboration between CFIs and the regulator to further professionalize the regulatory framework and to bring the regulations in a digestible way to the smaller SACOs and the larger SACOs. Uh, joining forces, I do think, is, is crucial for those who are smaller uh, to organize themselves via a shared digital platform and uh, the larger ones uh, who can do that maybe on their own, but jointly creating a level playing field. I, th I do also think, and that's what I've heard, this is that, well, we need constructive and suitable regulatory frameworks, suitable to the size and the context of the CFI, and that can benefit CFIs in their professionalization. Um, the uh, environmental sustainability and climate, we didn't really touch on these points, but we could have spent another hour on that specific topic and the impact on CFIs, their role to play, and uh, how to take that forward. Maybe that is part of one of the sessions in the coming, in the coming week. Um, women, we also touched on women and their role and the increasing um, uh, the importance to reach women as they are, can be catalyst in the economic development and the CFIs. So bringing on board women more, but maybe also digitization, using digitization to attract youth and rejuvenize the membership of the uh, CFIs. So all in all, this is only the start of a very nice week, 
that we will uh, looking forward to with many experience of many specialists and uh, professionals joining uh, in conversations, sharing their knowledge. And I would like to uh, have to to thank you, dear panel, uh, for your contribution today. Uh, Jean, thank you very much. Peter, thank you very much. And uh, Mathieu, you were excellent speakers in this opening session. And I would like to uh, hand over to Anderson for some cl closing remarks and uh, linkage to the rest of the uh, seminar. Many thanks, and I'm really looking forward to uh, a week of uh, in insights, knowledge, and learnings, and, uh, and collaboration. Thank you very much. Over to you, Anderson. Thank you so much, Marianne. This, this was an excellent summary no? and an excellent discussion. Uh, you are, let me thank also the panelists. No? And thank you so much, Marianne, for such a, a, a wonderful moderation. And then I'm looking here at the time and saying, wow, we are going to, to also make it like with good time management. It's a nice way to open. No? But what I wanted to tell everyone uh, uh, in the audience, thanking the audience as well, is that we have posted several links there in the chat. No? Please do sign up for the technical sessions. This was just like the initial kind of flavor uh, of the discussions that we will have five technical discussions, then a closing session up to November 11th. We are very excited. We have like 200, more than 200 people that have signaled that uh, they would like to join the forum, then they have registered. So, so this will be super exciting. And then uh, on, on behalf of the Center of Excellence uh, in the World Bank, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And, and, uh, and, and I hope that I'll be seeing you in the next sessions that we'll have throughout. Thank you so much again, Marianne, Jean, Peter, Matthew, and, 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 then, and, and thanks to all the audience for joining us today. So the session is, is over today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Edison. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Edison. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Merci.